Welcome to Long Covid Doctor, an educational series for sufferers of Long Covid. I'm Dr Tim Robinson, formerly a family doctor, GP for 30 years, now GP lead for three NHS Long Covid clinics, and a GP clinical lead in Long Covid across the southwest of England. This episode is on dizziness and Long Covid. In this part, part one, I talk about the symptoms, the diagnosis, investigations and causes. And in part two, I will talk about the treatments, management and outcomes. Check out the references and resources and links to social media in the show notes below. Just to say, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own doctor or medically qualified health professional. So here we go, dizziness and long COVID. So firstly, the context, the background. Dizziness and long COVID is common. Dizziness occurring in, is in occurring in so many different ways. In my experience, in the three long COVID clinics that I work in, is common and has a great impact on our patients. This may be the worsening of previous dizzy tendency or a completely new dizziness. Never had it before for no reason other than the fact that the patient has long COVID. And so what are our patients actually experiencing? What are the symptoms and associated symptoms? The word dizziness is just one of many words that patients use to describe what is what is what they are actually experiencing. The others are lightheadedness, faint feelings, wobbliness, unsteadiness, room spinning, vertigo, like being on a boat, like being drunk. All these sort of words are and descriptions are words and descriptions that our patients are telling us in our clinics. And there are often associated symptoms such as nausea and tinnitus, ringing in the ears, sweating, going cold and clammy. There may be visual disturbances where everything sort of goes black and they see stars. There may be palpitations or headaches, numbness, pins and needles, neck pain and many more. So how do we go about helping? Basically, we need to make a full medical assessment to get a diagnosis. We need to take a standard history and examination to get that diagnosis, to get the diagnosis more specifically. We're looking for possible differential diagnoses, other diagnoses in which the the, the symptom of dizziness are also is also present. So how do we go about this? So first and foremost, we need to take a thorough history and examination. Firstly, the standard detail history, everything about the dizziness or whatever you word the patient is, is describing it as. So what is actually happening to the patient? What is exactly what is exactly the patient experiencing and how often and how long that they are having their dizziness for how often is that occurring what factors make it worse what factors make it better what do they do when they have their dizziness to actually calm it down what have they found that actually makes it worse or triggers it and more importantly the impact that the dizziness or wobbliness or unsteadiness um, is having on the activities of their everyday living. We obviously want to know any other associated symptoms, like I gave you the list, the nausea or tinnitus, etc, etc. It's always helpful to know the past medical history, other illnesses that they might may have, and indeed any ill any medications they may be taking at this present time, or medications supplements, anything that they may have tried themselves to 
address the problem of their dizziness. And then it's on to the examination as guided by the symptoms and the history. A sort of routine examination, as I say, um, depending on their main features that they've told us in the history. So, having taken the history and the examination, it's on to investigations. So, your primary care general practitioner, your family doctor, will have investigated you already. They will have undertaken the usual blood panel, particularly the long COVID blood, plan blood panel, um, as recommended by the NICE guidelines for long COVID. So, that would be the for blood count the kidney function, the liver function, inflammatory markers such as CRP and ferritin, but also thyroid function test and HbA1c. So thyroid function is to check the, the, whether the thyroid is overactive, underactive, um, HbA1c, just to check that the patient isn't diabetic without us knowing. Maybe the patient needs a chest x-ray, maybe they need a 12-lead um, ECG, uh, cardiac tracing, maybe they need a CG that runs over 24 hours, three days, seven days, a halter tape. Maybe they actually, as a result of the history and examination, the GP basically thinks this patient needs to be referred to neurology, for example, or cardiology, for example, in the hospital. So, the reason why we, we have to be so thorough is to look out for red flags. So, i.e. those symptoms and signs that suggest something else is there, something else is occurring, something else more sinister indeed. So, what are the red flags in patients with dizziness? If there are any red flags, but the, the, if there aren't any red flags, you've not sort of come across any, um, then basically, you know, you, but, and, and you feel in your, in yourself, your instinct tells you that something isn't quite right, then, you know, just basically, there's no harm in asking. So go to your GP. So if you're a patient with dizziness and, you know, doesn't, you don't know what's going on, you know, and you want some help, ask your GP. And with red flag symptoms, such as, a sort of rapid onset dizziness that has come out of the blue, rapid onset, that is progressive, or there are other symptoms such as one-sided deafness, for example, or, you know, unstoppable, intractable nausea, or any other neurological signs. Um, you know, these are red flags, and they need to be brought to the attention of your GP to investigate appropriately. The other reason why we have to be so thorough is to be sure that we are not being so-called COVID, COVID blind. And what do I mean by this? So basically, if just because you've had COVID, it doesn't mean that a new symptom, a new problem, in this case dizziness, can be put down to that, to put down to the COVID. It might be due to another completely unrelated cause. And the COVID just happens to have occurred at the same time. So we mustn't be COVID blind, as I say. And so having completed the thorough history examination and now investigations, and we've excluded the red flags and excluded other diagnoses, we're left with the diagnosis of dizziness uh, that has arisen as part of the long COVID picture, i.e. dizziness, new onset, since having COVID. Um, but there are, like I said, patients bring to us all sorts of symptoms and have different meanings for them, okay? So and the, all these number of ways can present in patients with long COVID. And so in long COVID, what are the ways that dizziness can present? So returning now to the symptoms, the history, what the patients are actually telling us. We need to have a really clear understanding of the symptom. So is it room spinning or unsteadiness or faintness? Those are very different 
sort of descriptions, aren't they? Room spinning. It's not the same as unsteadiness, is it? And it's not the same as faintness. So it's it, it's this is really important in order to make the diagnosis and to know where the fault lies in order to manage it appropriately, correctly, and hence to put it right. So the reason for this is that there are many, many causes for dizziness, so many. And whatever the patient is calling it, be it, as I say, room spinning or unsteadiness or faintness, um, so it comes down to the story, the symptoms. And as they say, the devil is in the detail. So broadly speaking, dizziness can be divided into three presentations based on the symptoms that the patient has given you. They are as follows. So first of all, there's giddiness. And that is when the room is spinning round and round. Secondly, there is unsteadiness. And that is sort of a wobbliness, like being on a boat or a pontoon. And then thirdly, there's lightheadedness, lightheadedness, faint feeling, like you're going to faint. So I'll explain each in turn, because each of them have different underlying causes and hence different ways to manage them. So giddiness and unsteadiness will be the first, the two that I explain, and that will be in this one, this part, this presentation, part one. Um, I will then in part two talk about lightheadedness. So giddiness and unsteadiness in part one and lightheadedness in part two. So firstly, giddiness. As I said earlier, the patients say things like, the room is spinning. My head is doing somersaults. This describes the medical term vertigo. This is often associated with symptoms of nausea, maybe even vomiting. Tinnitus, so ringing in the ears, maybe hearing loss. This is all due to a problem in the inner ear. Remembering, thinking ear, okay, you've got the outer ear, i.e. ear lobe and the canal between the outside world and the eardrum. You've got the middle ear, beyond the eardrum, and then you've got the inner ear, where the hearing mechanisms are the balance apparatus and the semicircular canals and their nerve conductions, con no, beg your pardon, connections, um, with the balance centre in the brainstem. And also the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which is why patients with vertigo also have nausea. So chemoreceptor trigger zone is the, if you like, vomit centre. Okay, the nausea, the vomit center. Okay, so there are connections with the semicircular canals and the balance apparatus, um, nerve connections with the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the nausea, vomiting center. And this is why patients with vertigo often have nausea and maybe even vomiting, as I say. So the causes for this is head spinning, giving us our labyrinthitis or vestibulitis, B, PPV, many as disease and vestibular migraine. So let's just quickly cover all those. Um, as I say, the causes for head spinning giddiness are labyrinthitis, vestibulitis. So it's due to a viral infection of those inner ear organs. Second one was B, PPV, which stands for benign paroxysmal uh, positional vertigo. And we assessed it this by doing this is we assess this in general practice by doing something called the Hall Pike test to look for flicking of the eyes, otherwise known as nystagmus. If that's present, the Hall Pike test is positive. That patient has B PPV. And then the third was Meniere's disease, they, uh, which basically is a, um, a a triad of one vertigo two deafness and three tinnitus and fourthly vestibular migraine so this is a sort of um, 
a less common form of migraine compared with sort of the frontal one-sided migraine that patients get the classic migraine. So vestibular migraine is, is migraine occurring um, more at the posterior part of, of the brain, um, in which you know there may be associated headaches, usually one-sided. There may well be a sort of family history of migraine, but more often than not, it's just something that presents with this this vertiginous vertigo um, sort of room spinning type of symptom. So the GP will need to assess the patient and maybe prescribe prochlorperazine, stematil, uh, or bucostem, the sublingual, um, i.e. a tablet that, that dissolves um, under the lip uh, form. But there's also another drug called ondansetron, which is particularly good for nausea, but would help as well. If the pet GP's not, uh, not sure, or those treatments haven't worked, and the symptoms are persistent, then obviously the GP will want to refer that patient to the to the hospital to see an ear, nose, and throat specialist, or maybe even a neurologist, but probably ENT first of all, for confirmation of the diagnosis. Maybe they'll need a CT scan of the organs of the inner ear, looking for something called an acoustic neuroma. So it all comes down to what the GP makes of, of the symptoms and the examination, etc. If the dizziness has followed on from an acute COVID illness and persists since then, it probably can be assumed that it is due to the effect of the virus, the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this may be due to a number of causes. It may be due to a direct effect of the virus on the nerve fibres or even on the brainstem nuclei themselves that have been the virus carried in by white blood cells, the Trojan horse route, so-called, or across a leaky blood-brain barrier, normally impervious to white blood cells. Um, uh, but in COVID, because of inflammation, that causes a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and allows infected cells, theoretically, through into the brain. Other causes for, for this to all occur is the effect of inflammation on the brain, so due to excessive inflammatory response. So those cytokines that we're all familiar with hearing about from outside the brain itself, or the overactivity of the brain immune tissues, the microglia, or due to mast cell activation. There are lots of mast cells around the brain stem areas. So they can be kicked off and release their inflammatory mediators. Then another cause for damage to the sort of, if you like, the inner ear and the neurological nerve fibers, etc., serving the inner ear hearing organs are autoantibodies to the nerves. That's antibodies attacking our own normal, our own normal cells, autoantibodies to the nerves or all the supportive tissues on the brainstem. And then blood clots. We've all heard of the microthrombi. Um, they've been identified any place during and many places in the in the brain and the brainstem, um, or the audio vestibular cranial nerve, due to excessive inflammatory response. And so there are numerous mechanisms to conclude. <laughs> There are numerous mechanisms at play in long COVID and any one patient may have one or some or all of these mechanisms happening. If these long COVID causes are responsible for this form of long COVID giddiness, okay, um, there is very little one can do about it apart from treating the symptom with the drugs I mentioned earlier, i.e. the prochlorperazine um, or endansetron. And, and to wait for the natural healing to occur, that is, you know, waiting for viral clearance to occur, waiting for inflammation to settle, 
waiting for nerve fibres to be restored by the process of neuroplasticity, rewiring, reconnecting, or making waiting for those microthrombi, those mini blood clots, to be cleared, and for those 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 blood vessels where the clots are, are occurring to be recanalized, so re-established, or new blood vessels established around the blockage. So if it is due to vestibular migraine, as opposed to all those other causes, um, the GP can prescribe for acute attacks with sumatriptan, which is the, obviously the drug we use for acute migraine, for acute classic migraine. So if the patient has confirmed vestibular migraine and they don't have it very often, then you know they can have imigran or sumatriptan to dampen it down when it occurs. If, however, the these vestibular migraines are frequent, then I think preventative prophylactic treatment is needed. So they say that if you're having more than two migraines a week, you should be on prophylactic preventative treatment. And that's what I would want if that was me. So a trial of amitriptyline initially would be the drug of choice. It's been around for 50 something years or even longer. Um, tried and tested. It was an old anti. It was the original antidepressant, but we're not giving. We wouldn't be giving it to patients because of depression. We'd be giving it to them because it is a um, an excellent drug to prevent migraine and nerve pain. Actually, so that's if if the the, the this sort of giddiness is is occurring because of the. Um, uh, because of uh, vestibular migraine, if if it's if if it's causing being caused by BPV, benign positional uh, paroxysmal positional vertigo, the patient should be treated with something called the Epley maneuver, a sequence of head positions uh, to redistribute the the calcium granules, otherwise known as otoliths, inside the semicircular canals of the inner ear. So that's giddiness, vertiginous head spinning, room spinning dealt with. Okay, so like I said, in this part one, I'm dealing with giddiness, but I'm also this um, the room spinning type of dizziness. But I'm also dealing with um, the other cause of inadvertent commas dizziness, and that is unsteadiness or wobbliness. Okay, this is the other description best description for this other sort of subgroup of dizziness. So as I said, patients describe this as being on a boat or on a, on a pontoon, not able to walk in a straight line, needing to use furniture or door frames or walls to check themselves as they're walking around inside um, to stabilise themselves when they're walking. So the common cause for this is cervical spondylosis, which in lay speak is osteoarthritis, wear and tear in the, 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 the joints between the vertebrae in the neck, the cervical vertebrae. OK, so it's osteoarthritis in the neck, cervical vertebrae, common in everyone over 50. By 50, the bad news is we're all going to have a degree of cervical spondylosis, wear and tear in the neck. Patients tell us that it's like having sand in the neck. They, des they describe that. It's a very common description. Um, I've heard it so many times in general practice. Um, patients say that their neck feels tight or it clicks. Okay. The range of movement when you examine the patient may be reduced. Okay. The range of movement of your neck your head on your neck may be reduced. There may even be shooting pains down the arm as you sort of tilt your head to one side, then that may cause pain to radiate down the that arm that you the arm on the side that you are tilting your head towards. This is due to a narrowed space between the the vertebrae in the neck due to osteoarthritis. This pinches the 
cervical nerves, the nerves coming out um, between the vertebral bodies and stimulates the balance receptors. And when they're stimulated, they, they send signals to the balance center in the brain at the wrong time. The brain tells you you're moving when you're not. So it registers this as a movement and hence the unsteadiness that patients experience. All the above is worsened if the neck muscles are tight. And the commonest cause for this is stress, tension. Um, there is a lot of that in long COVID, of course, understandably so, considering the effect that long COVID is having on the patient and their life. So what can we do about this, this form of dizziness? How can we undress? Uh, how can we address the stress and tension that makes this dizziness or unsteadiness worse? Well, basically, we need to loosen up the neck joints, the muscles and the ligaments. So physical manipulation, such as physiotherapists can help, osteopaths, chiropractics, they can all help Okay, to stretch the tight joints in the neck, to to stretch the ligaments and, uh, and and the sort of the capsules surrounding the joints. Acupuncture again, that's that has something to offer. Either Eastern traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture or Western dry needling, so called, can release pressure points that the patient might have in the neck. Um, there's also Gentle mind-body techniques such as yoga and tai chi can be helpful, not only for stretching those tight tissues and joints, but also for their stress-reducing benefits, as demonstrated in many published studies. So, that's the second cause of dizziness on my list, namely the list being unsteadiness. Um, giddiness, first of all, um, room spinning, uh, the second cause, namely unsteadiness or wobbliness, dealt with. Um, and that really concludes the first part of my talk on dizziness and long COVID and the symptoms, the diagnoses and investigations that I would recommend. In the second part, I'll talk about the, the third form of dizziness, um, and basically, that is that is the the dizziness, uh, as I as I ex explained, is sort of like lightheadedness. Okay, I'll come on to that in the in the second part. I hope you found that helpful, nice and clear. It's pretty complicated, I'm afraid. I apologise for that, but hopefully, the way I've explained it is very straightforward. So check out any references and resources and links to social media in the show notes below. As I mentioned at the start, any advice, diagnoses, treatments that I mention should only be considered after discussion with your own doctor or medical, medically qualified professional. So in the meantime, I wish you well. I wish you well in your long COVID recovery. So cheerio.